Happy Sabbath. Once again, I know we're getting to the end of it, but uh, Abraham Heschel in his book on the Sabbath, he actually says that the Sabbath is like a welcome guest that you don't want to leave. And so um, this is how I feel, especially about this wonderful time that we've had that we've shared together over the last several days. It's been the warmth of the company that we've enjoyed and also the temperature has collaborated. We've had very nice warm temperature. Um, this is actually the first night that I'm seeing a lot of fans going. I've been lucky to go the second half of the night. And so when I come out, it's actually cooler. So it's nice to see all the motion with the fans. Uh, so tonight we're gonna be dealing with a really amazing and intense topic. Uh, I hope to do it justice because it's for me one of the climaxes. I mean, Exodus is full of climaxes. It's very hard to pick a favorite chapter or a favorite section, but if I was to pick one, I mean, chapter 20 is really great. We're going to cover that briefly. But it's the apostasy, right? Like, how can that be your favorite chapter? It's because God's response to it is so amazing, so kind, so merciful. We see his character shining. If you remember the first presentation that I did, those of you that were here on, uh, I think it was Wednesday night, we talked about Moses' prayer in Psalm 90. And how he said, Lord, come, may your glory come back. May we see your glory. He, remember he was saying how long he was looking at the prophecy in um, Genesis 15 that said, for 400 years, your descendants will serve this nation. But then they will come out with great, uh, we talked about the, the hands of praise, how they came out. And they pillaged the Egyptians or they were paid for their work. The reparations that Jeffrey spoke about. And then now we have this amazing continuity, right? And so tonight, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to join us and bless our time together. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come together to um, study more about Exodus, the way in which you have provided liberation for each of us. This is a very amazing um, uh, chapter here, this section, this pericope that we're going to study, and I just pray that you send your Holy Spirit to uh, bring down the glory that you represented to Moses so that his face was shining when he came down. May our faces be shining by the time that we're done tonight. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So, um, if you guys remember, last night we talked about the trajectory. So we kind of started here the call of Moses, the friend of the bridegroom. So remember, we're talking marriage analogy. That's kind of my specialty. I like to look at it as Exodus, a love story. So here we have the call of Moses, the friend of the bridegroom. And I was telling some of the boys who were out there um, the other day uh, in the prayer room and how John Luca, my husband, and I, where are you, John Luca? I just, there you are. Okay. Uh, so my husband and I, we actually... So when I came, I think I mentioned when I was talking about Moses and his language that when we came here, I was here from 5 to 10, then I went back to Argentina, and I came back to the States when I was 13. Well, during that intern, I skipped a grade, and so when I came, John Luca and I were actually in the same grade together. I came halfway through or a few months into eighth grade, and the teacher said to me, the principal, Mrs. Strayman, she said, you're going to go into eighth grade. And I said, no, 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 because when I was here before, I have friends from that, and I want to go back and stay with them. I want to be in seventh grade, please. And she says, no, young lady, you're going to come with me. Let's go, and you're going to eighth grade. Someday you will thank me. And I was like, oh, this is so not good. And then John Luca was in a different eighth grade, but at the end of eighth grade, we had graduation. And my last name starts with a C, and his last name, which is now my last name as well, starts with a B. And so we had to march down the aisle together. And this was the first time that my now husband, John Luca, came up to me and he said, what color dress are you going to wear? And this, I had zero idea why he was asking me this question. I just thought he's super weird. Let's just get this walking down, over with, and then we can go our merry ways. But I showed up the night of the graduation and he was wearing, I told him I was gonna wear a pink dress and he was wearing a pink tie. And I thought, he cares, like those love is in the details, right? And I thought, that is amazing. But then during high school, we, you know, he was kind of a class clown and I was super intense, kind of, sort of. I know you wouldn't, those of you, know, you who know my husband, who's an international corporate lawyer, would not think that he was a class clown. But if you saw some images of him dressed up as uh, dancing, or I, I guess it was, uh, well, let's just leave it there. Let's not go into it. Uh, so we had a friend, Derek Douglas, who was the best man at our, our wedding, who was the go-between here. 
So other times when I presented this, I have pictures of our wedding and so forth, but Derek was the go-between, and during high school, he'd talk to Gianluca about me, and then he'd come, he's like, oh, Gianluca's asking this or doing this. So um, it's, it's something that I've experienced, right? This intermediary, this person that you become very close to. I was actually closer to uh, Derek than to Gianluca throughout high school because I talked to him all the time. But uh, then finally there was the showdown of the suitors, right? In my particular experience, there was another guy I was dating, not Gianluca, but then finally Gianluca proved himself to be the top guy, right? So I married him, and then he, he shipped me off. He took me off and he proposed at some point, and this is what he does. Yahweh arrives and he guides his precious bride to his holy mountain where he's gonna propose. But before that, there is a whiny, and Gianluca and I, I think we broke up two or three times during the dating and the courtship, but eventually, how many years, baby? Married. That's right. I'm thinking about other things right now, but yeah, 26. So, um, so then he proposed, right? And this is where we were last night. We go to proposal, and usually what happens after the proposal is there's a period of getting ready for the, for the, the day, getting the dress, the purity, the heart, preparing the heart. Sometimes people break it off during that time, and they're like, yeah, this, is, this was not a good idea. But Israel continued, and so the groom came and he gave his vows. His ten, it's called the Decalogos, the ten words, where he promised what he was going to do. And let's see, um, he said, we didn't cut, Ty did an incredible job. Like both, uh, everybody is like, I'm furtively taking notes and just so uh, impressed with everybody, and I would love to incorporate everything they said. But he, he touched on the Ten Commandments and what he called the prologue or part of the first commandment which is because I brought you to myself, right? I've lovingly redeemed you to myself. Because of that, I promise you will. And this notion of promise is something that's ingrained in the very grammatical structure of the Hebrew, where you can read the Ten Commandments both as an emphatic um, imperative, where you will not, or you can read it as a promise. You will not want to. This is what you will do. So I kind of rewrote the Ten Commandments from that perspective, or what I like to call the Ten Promises. Number one, know that I, Yahweh, am the only God who can save. We will see later on that idolatry has to do with seeing something other than God as your means to salvation. Number two, which is in bold because we're going to come back to this. To me, this is the heart of the Ten Commandments. Love and honor your devoted husband, God, who is jealous for your love. Number three, live out my glorious name among the nations. Remember, you marry someone, you take on their name. We call ourselves Christians. What kind of reputation are we giving God by the way that we relate to other people? This is something that also, um, in the last presentation, Ty spoke about beautifully. Uh, so number four, remember our Sabbath weekly versary. So this is a word I came up with. You're not gonna find it in the dictionary. But the weekly versary is the time once a week when you come together to catch up, right? So it's been a busy week. Sometimes you don't have time to maybe read your Bible. Ideally, we're all doing that, right? There's spiritual disciplines, which are great to do. But to be realistic, sometimes, I remember when I was a mom and I had my three kids, like I would get my little bits and pieces in with their little reading and that had to be it for me because I was totally decimated by the end of the day. There was no chance I was going to do my deep devotional study. Um, but God understands. So he gives us a day every seven days, like today, Shabbat Shalom, that we can share with one another, with creation, and with him. Number five, respect your parents and all authority. Number six, promote the life and well-being of everyone around you. Number seven, cherish faithfulness in marriage and purity in all your relationships. Eight, seek and advance only the truth. Number nine, respect the property of others and generously share what you own. And number 10, be content with and grateful for all that I have given you. So here we see that thus far we've seen, and actually we could put a lower category underneath this, where we've seen the name of God expressed in different ways. So in chapter 3, we see God coming back as the God of the ancestors. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have come to redeem you. I have heard the affliction of the children, and I care, and I have come to deliver you. He's the deliverer, but that's still a promise. It's in the future. So then we see in the song of, and that was last night, in the song of deliverance, the song of Moses, they say, our God has become our salvation. He is a man of war. Because remember the Egyptians, they said, oh no, we need to turn around, we need to go back because God is fighting for the Israelites. They realized finally, like it was like no dub, but it, was, it took them a while, 
that God was fighting for them. So then we see the man of war. The second we see Lord as the covenant maker. That was the, the decalogos, the ten words, that the ten promises that he's giving his beloved bride. And then finally what we're going to focus on tonight is the concept of God as a vulnerable God. He is the jealous husband. And we're going to see that not only does he mention that he is jealous, but he's going to say, now, my name is jealous. He's going to give a new dimension to his name, and this is important. So let's go. We're here now at the second commandment, and the second commandment reads, you shall not make for yourself an image, which is an idol, or an idol, which is an image, in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Remember I mentioned you can bow down like to some degree, Pharaoh was bowing before God when he said, pray for me, you know, that I can have freedom. I've sinned. God is right. He's acknowledging the authority. God is definitely more powerful because he couldn't continue to replicate the magic that uh, God was doing. So, but he wasn't worshiping. This word is to serve. And then he says, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, which sounds really bad. But it's actually not. It's just the continuity. We call it sometimes generational curses or things that we do that get passed on to our kids. For the sin uh, to the fourth and fourth of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So here we see that the concept of love and hate, God just says, I just want you to love me. You love me and chesed, which is God's prevailing love, his 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 loving watch care. Actually, I have a book on Hesed and the many, many ways that you can interpret it. You know, it's kindness, it's love, it's surrender, it's all these things. And he's saying, I will pour this upon you and all I'm asking for you is to understand that your joy and your happiness is with me. And so you can have this love for me because I am your savior. So these words, I believe, are the condensed hearts of the law, conveying the intensely intimate and dynamic union that God is seeking with each one of us. We see a massive condescension of the omnipotent and transcendent God who in his eagerness to have his love returned, he makes himself vulnerable to the rejection of his bride. So in giving the law, God has revealed his holy image, right? And in keeping the law, Israel would reflect the divine image. This was the idea, right? So it was a very simple, we think, agreement. Now, we also talked last night about, about the imagination, about how we perceive things. And if you think about the word imagination, you have imagination. You have a nation that conforms to a certain image or that creates a certain image. And unfortunately, in the passages that we're reading tonight or that we're contemplating on tonight, we go from image bearers, which was the ideal that God had for his nation to image makers. So they go from carrying the reflection of the only creator God to then trying to reflect. They're creating something that we're going to see is actually refuse. So now we dive into the story. This is kind of just background, right? Now we're uh, in, the, in the thrust of it. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. By the way, I just, I have to say this. This is a, a tangent. Is this not beautiful? Like this amazing here, uh, Ten Commandments. I don't know if you guys noticed, but up until this point, the background was like mountains because we've been going to the mountains and now we have these beautiful two tablets, which I think is nice, but I can't read this word really well in there. So now, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together. Now in the Hebrew, when they gather together to Aaron, it actually means they gather together against Aaron. So they're kind of coming with a little mob mentality and they're saying, Come make us gods that shall go up before us. For as this man Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So let me backtrack. In the, the different mountain meetings that we had, we're at the very last meeting, right? The meeting where the architect goes up, and now he's going to prepare a house so that they can dwell together. David's going to come out after me, and he's going to be talking about the sanctuary. Because at the, at the very... Um, so let's see, it was... Yeah, he says, uh, chapter 25, verse 8, he says, come, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So he says, okay, I'm going to go up, and God's going to give me the plans. So for the next chapter, from chapter 25 all the way to chapter 30, about for five chapters, he's there receiving 
minute details about how this wonderful home is going to come together. And as we talked about last night also, the pillar of fire and cloud in which God's presence was, and he was protecting them. He was their shield against the Egyptians, and he was their light at night. He would come and he would abide above the mercy seat, and he would be their merciful Lord and Savior. So while Moses is there, furtively, you know, frantically writing down all the details of that, God turns to him. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So here, let's focus on one detail. So it says, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. So God is going to tell Moses what's going on. But in the meantime, this is what's going on, is that they've gathered together. And so Aaron has this really clever idea. He says, okay, guys, go ask your wives to give you all the jewelry that they have, and then we'll build an idol, because they want to build an idol. And he's imagining that the wives are going to be like, no way, Jose, like, that's my jewelry. Not giving it up for any idol. Like, you think of another plan. But the wives had no problem giving up their jewelry. And so, unfortunately, that plan did not work for Aaron. So now we see that instead of Yahweh bringing them out of the land of Egypt, now they're saying, this man, Moses, we don't know what's become of him. He's up in the mountain. Maybe the smoke, maybe the lightning and thunder that's up there at the top, of, maybe he's consumed. Like, we don't know. But they were, remember the song of deliverance last night? God is our salvation, Yahweh, deliverance, you know, he is the Lord. And immediately now we're probably a good at least 40 days, right? So there were a few days till the giving of the law. Um, Davidson's amazing at this. So there, there is, but let's say four or five weeks. So it was about a, a month, month and a half. And now all of a sudden they're saying, this is not the man who brought us, the, the, the savior that brought us out of, out of Egypt is not Yahweh. It's a man, this man, Moses. And then they turned around after creating this golden calf, and they said, this golden calf is your God, O Israel. It brought you out of Egypt. So now we see yet another level of degradation. So from, um, sorry, did I go forward or back? Oh, yeah. So originally we had Savior, Lord, Jealous Husband. We had this idea of bringing Israel from the bottom up, from slaves all the way up to the precious bride of Christ. And now we have a descent. Immediately, just with one moment's uh, decision and the mob mentality, actually, uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White says that some people reacted and they said, we can't do this. Like, this is not a good idea. This is not what God's been asking us. And they, they retaliated. They, they, they rebuked those that were wanting to build a golden calf and they were killed. So Aaron's stepping back and he's thinking, okay, I don't want to die, so let's go ahead and build this. But now we've had a degradation that has taken place from the God to Moses, and now we have the golden calf who will eventually, uh, in the next few verses, become refuse out of the Israelites so that they know what they're worshiping or what they were worshiping. In Deuteronomy 4, 12 verse 13, the Lord, this is Moses thinking back about what happened when God gave them the Ten Commandments, and he says, the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. He says, you heard the sound of words. You saw no form, no image. You only heard a voice. He declared, he spoke, he declared to you his covenant, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. So the image of God was given not in an image of a calf or anything else. It was given in the image of words that were then, well, the image of letters. You know, when children are small and they're learning to draw and write. Um, and sometimes they, I had those books, I don't know if you had those moms, but it was the A was in the shape of an alligator or the B, you know, a B, and so they would kind of morph into a shape. It is a shape, it is a form, it's written, but it's words that convey precise meaning. This is uh, very important. So the image of God was related by his words, whereas the image of idolatry is whatever we see, the things that we want to consume, the things that call our attention, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are the things that they wanted. And so we know that idolatry is looking to anything else, looking for something that will satisfy our desire so that we feel a sense of salvation. It's usually something that's short-lived and it needs to be replenished over and over and over. This is one reason why God loves time, because we tend to be consumers and we need time to be able to reflect on the most important thing. In Psalm 90, Moses says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And that's why God gives us the Sabbath day because he knows that time allows us to value what really matters, relationships instead of possessions and things. So now uh, in Romans 1.25, Paul comments on the general state of idolatry. 
and it really relates to what we're seeing in the golden calf. It says, they exchanged the truth of God, which was his word that he had given them for the lie, it says. It's not just a lie. It's not one lie. There was only, sorry, it, it's not many lies. It's not your truth, my truth, whatever. There's only one truth and one lie. And the one truth is that Christ, Yahweh, is the way, the truth, and the life. And the one lie is that you're your own God. You decide, right? You make your own idol. So now we go back to the narrative, and Moses says, or God says to Moses, get down. Now, what's interesting to me is that during this whole process, God knows what's happening, and he's still kind of relaying to Moses all the things about the sanctuary, while in the back of his mind, he's like, okay, these guys, they're continuing. He could have stopped it. He could have said, Moses, you know, these folks down there, they're kind of starting to think of something bad. Hurry up, get down there so you can stop it. He didn't do that. He let it morph into, it, it was actually an orgy. of When they rose up to play, the Hebrew word, and, and it's, I was reading it just before coming this afternoon, and it's three times over that it was the sound of an orgy. You know, it says, it's the sound of music I hear, the sound of play. It was actually, it was worse than that. So Moses is, you know, doesn't know what's going on, and God says, your people who you brought out of the land, They've corrupt. You know, as a parent, sometimes when your child misbehaves, you say, oh, your son, go discipline your son or your daughter. Yeah, I don't know. She's her father's daughter. I don't know what she... So he's kind of... So it looks like he's stepping back, but he's actually not. If you think about it, what had the people said? The people said, Moses, this man Moses who brought us out of Egypt. So God's just repeating what they said. This man Moses, you who brought them out of Egypt, your people, because they're claiming you, They've made a calf, so go down. And he says, let me alone, which in the Greek actually means, please, like I'm struggling. This is a very plaintive, mournful, pleading sound. Please, like leave me alone so I can grieve that my anger may burn hot, which sounds really bad, but we'll talk about that in a minute, against them, and I may consume them, and I will make out of you a great nation. Now, Moses had written... Genesis. And in Genesis, I believe it's 18. I don't know if you have your Bibles, you can look it up to confirm. There is the intercession of uh, Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. And in it, God is so merciful where he goes down from 50 to 10. You know, he was, and so Moses has that in his head. And he says, God is approachable. Remember in chapter 5 and 6 uh, that we covered where Mo Moses had five excuses and God was listening to him, and finally he's like, okay, Moses, we can play whatever game you want to play. You know, I'll go along with it. Just I want you to be part of this, this project. Uh, and so God was actually inviting intercession, which is beautiful, because both we see the passion of God, the love of God, the pain of being rejected by his bride. This is like on the wedding night, right? So right after the wedding night, the bride is seduced. Actually, the wedding night hasn't happened, but that's, that's because they're, they're not actually... No, actually they are. This was, <laughs> so if we had this slide, because there was a friend of mine who pressed me, uh, um, Davidson and Aaron Cruz are like, well, where would that be? And actually that would be the dinner with the elders, because anyway, talk to me about that after. That's kind of, uh, I haven't finessed that yet. But it's almost as if, like after the wedding ceremony, the bride has an affair. She goes off and she's having an affair because God can see what's happening kind of in the face of the husband, the man she just married, which is incredibly painful. So he says, and I will make out of you a great generation. So now Moses has power because he's going to be the representative of this new nation. And so he knows he's got clout or he's got um, space to intervene. And so he responds, and he says, Lord, why does your anger burn hot against your people, whom you, your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? So he throws it back at him. Uh, and then this is, God doesn't answer, but this is his answer in Deuteronomy 32, which is the second song of Moses that we didn't get into because it's more negative than the first song of Moses. But you can look it up in your own time in Deuteronomy 32. He says, for they are children in whom there is no faith. Like, I just gave them all these promises and they don't believe me. They think you've disappeared in a cloud. They don't trust that I'm building this beautiful home for them, that I'm going to dwell with them, that I'm going to make them a great nation. They've provoked me to jealousy with what is not God. So uh, then Moses responds to him and says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
your servants whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he had said he would do to his people. What do we see there? I mean, this is so powerful because Moses, all he's saying is like, you said this. Like, and he's like, okay, you're right, I said that. I mean, that was, that was pretty easy. That didn't take a lot of work. And what we see here is that the power that we have for anything that we need is in claiming the promises of God. It's all in there, in his promises. We need to internalize what they are so that in a moment of crisis, we can repeat to God his word. And in Isaiah 55, he says, my word will not return to me void, but it will accomplish that for which I sent it. So God is a faithful covenant keeper. This is another passage that I love that talks specifically about the power of the word of God. It says, the creative energy that called the world into existence is in the word of God. Each word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It restores the nature and recreates the soul into the image of God. So the way that we become image bearers instead of image makers is by believing the promises of God. So we go back to the narrative now. As soon as Moses came near the camp, which was great, because God, remember, he's burning hot. He's like, I'm burning hot, just like all of you guys here. You're kind of burning hot. You're fanning. (laughs) He was burning hot. And Moses is like, Lord, why are you burning hot? But as soon as Moses steps down from the mountain and he sees what they're doing, he had no idea could get. He's like, okay, golden calf. They build a golden calf. I've seen that before. But the, what, the reason that you know that what they were doing was abominable is because Moses is now burning hot. He'd heard what they'd done, but when he's seeing it, he's like, I had no idea it was this bad. And he takes the Ten Commandments that God had just given him, and he throws them at the base of Sinai in plain sight of everybody else symbolically representing that the covenant, the marriage with God, is now broken at the base of Sinai, and there is no more covenant. Now, those of you who remember, there is uh, this, and I'm not going to get into it, but Moses says, okay, what you guys have done is terrible, but he says, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me, right? So you guys have done a horrible thing. But if you're not happy about it, if you did it because you were, you know, whatever, all you have to do is come to me. Come to the Lord's side, right? Moses was standing on the Lord's side, and he invited whoever wanted to. So the first people that were there were the Levites. They hadn't even participated. And then people started to pour in, right? It just takes sometimes one person to set an example, or one tribe in this case to set an example, and then people flow in. And so there were many, many people that flew in. That flowed in. I guess they weren't flying. They were just walking. Um, The problem is there were 3,000 that just stayed. They're like, no. I mean, this this is what we know. It was probably, we know it was started by the mixed multitude because it stands to reason that this is what they were most familiar with. But they didn't want to go to God's side. And so they were destroyed. Now, some people look at this and they say, the God of the Old Testament He's a bad guy. We don't like him because he destroys people. He doesn't forgive them. We just saw, he said, whoever wants to come to my side. So they're not reading the text thoroughly, right? But also this, they didn't read Jude. Jude is just one chapter, so Jude, verse 5. And this is what it says. Now, your Bibles won't say this because your Bibles, a lot of Bibles don't translate this properly. That's why it's good to sometimes go to the Greek and the Hebrew. James, or um, Jude is saying, I want to remind you. Sorry, it's James, not Jude. That's my mistake. Uh, This is James, verse 5, Jude. I don't know how many verses it has. But uh, though you once knew that... Hold on. Am I? I think I'm a little sleep deprived. It's James. Is it Jude? Somebody look up Jude. Yes, that's right. Five chapters in James. Jude. We're at Jude. Guys, this is perfect. I did my research. The slide is intact. Uh, My memory is not. So uh, that's okay. So though you once knew this, that in your versions will say, for those of you that have it open, doesn't it say, what does your say? Do you have verse 5 on there? What does your say? That? Yours says Jesus. What does your say? 
Yours is the Lord. Okay, my version is New King James, and the majority will say the Lord. They don't say Jesus. What's your version? That, uh, New Living. New Living. Okay, I love the New Living because that is right. It says Jesus. The word there is Jesus. Having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, then destroyed those who did not believe. Remember, he said, come to my side. And those who didn't believe and didn't want to believe that that was the way of salvation, they said our way is the way of salvation. There was no other chance. You remember when we saw the big cloud, the, the cloud that was separating the Egyptians as they were coming? The cloud that was towards the Egyptians was darkness and confusion. The, the cloud that was towards the um, Israelite camp was light and brightness and clarity and life. And this is exactly what happens to those who reject God. They inhabit the darkness and confusion. Ultimately, it's destruction. They destroy themselves. So Jesus again, Jesus, Hebrew Yeshua from Yahshua, Joshua, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves. And that was the name of our Lord and Savior, is the name of our Lord and Savior. So Jesus basically saved all who came to his side. So now, this is really interesting. This is from the commentary I've been ref referencing during this time, uh, written by Richard Davidson on the Exodus. And he, this is really impressive. So Aaron is the one who actually made the golden calf. That's what scripture says, even though he said it just popped out. You know, we threw stuff in and, whoop, miracle. You know, God made this miracle. Um, which, again, so he's lying. He's like, <laughs> like, let's make a list of all the things that Aaron has done wrong. But he is the one who's ultimately forgiven because he comes to the side and he's assigned the position of high priest, the only Israelite allowed to go into the very presence of God in the most holy place, the one who represented Israel before God. This may well be the ultimate expression of God's amazing grace revealed in the account of the Exodus. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Now, the issue here is that those who chose not to believe chose, and this is very interesting. I didn't see this in the commentary, but a friend of mine who's doing the commentary on Jeremiah, so there's lots of idols in Jeremiah, he talks about this. So in uh, Psalm 155, it says, their idols are silver and gold, have mouths but can't speak, eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear. They have hands, but they can't feel. Now, God so far has done one. He's spoken to them. He's given them his promises. He has eyes to see their affliction. He has ears to hear their groaning and their pain. He has hands and heart to feel and to, to carry them. I've borne you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. These guys don't. They have feet, but they can't walk, right? They're idols. They're statues. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Now, this is the line. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. So by beholding, we become changed. This is why we have to be careful. Remember that song when you know, your kids, those who have kids, be careful little eyes what you see, because you will eventually start to reflect the things that you admire, that you look to. In Exodus 33, he says to, when he says, will you come to us? You know, he, God forgives him, and God, or will you forgive us? Moses goes to intercede, and he says, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments. I guess they still had some left over. They didn't use all of them because that's what they used to make the golden calf, that I may know what to do with you. So this is a moment where God takes, there's a tent of meeting that's moved away from the camp off to the side, and then you have on the other side the camp. And Moses would come over and try to intercede with God during that time, and every time that the people saw Moses get up and go over to the tent of meeting, they would bow at their tents. They were praying to the Lord. They were eager to be received. They were truly contrite and repentant. They loved their Lord. They weren't afraid. They truly had this desire to be reinstated, and God knew that. So then there's this great conversation that takes place. Moses says, now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight. Number, well, I pray. So his prayer is, I guess, it should be two. Actually, this should be, if I have found grace in your sight, this should be actually one. Well, however you want to, but the if and then has to do with show me your way. If I found grace, show me your way for two things, that I might know you and that I might find grace. So he's like, if I have found grace, show me your way that I can find grace. It's like, well, you already have grace. Why do you, why do you need more grace? But this is the whole concept of from glory to glory. God is continually revealing new elements of his grace to us. And as we come close to him in humility, he will reveal his truths to us. The moment we seek to understand his word, he is there to give us more grace to understand. 
and consider that this nation is your people. And God says, okay. He says, yes, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, both of those, let me go back. Both of those are in the singular. In the English, we don't, you know, y'all. We don't have y'all in the Bible. Um, you do in the Greek. So, or sorry, in the Hebrew, you do have. So we can see that it was actually the singular. It's not the plural. He says, Moses, I'll go with you. Just the man. I'm not going to go with them. Remember, they're the stiff-necked. Now, the interesting thing that what I didn't mention is stiff-necked is what the idols were. They could... They, they couldn't turn either way. They, they were stiff-necked. So the, what, when God calls them stiff-necked, he's saying, you have become an idol. You are like, remember uh, Lot's wife, where she's just worshiping her possessions and looking back, and God's like, okay, now you become a frozen idol, right? She becomes a pillar of salt. She becomes what she worships. And so Moses isn't cool with this. He's like, no, 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 it's not going to be just me. This is your people. So he says this. If your presence doesn't go with us, don't bring us up from here. For how then will it be known to the nations, right? Because God says all the world is mine. And Moses knows that. He knows that the whole purpose of this Exodus thing is to reach not just Egypt, which was God's initial purpose, but all the world. So he says, how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? So now he's, put, he's, he's like, it's not just me. Because God's like, it's just you. He's like, no, no, no. He's putting himself together, like a lot of those prayers, like uh, we see the prayer of Daniel in chapter 9 and other prayers where it's like, it's us. It's a community of faith. We are the church. We are those that have been called out of Egypt. How will it be known that we have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we, again, the plural, shall be separate, your people and I, plural, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth, right? How will we let your, um, your mercy, your grace, how can we intercede for the nation? And this is the thing. As soon as you touch, this is like God's Achilles heel. The moment you say, God, I need you because I've got to reach this person, God's like, okay, I don't know what you've done, whatever. Like, I'm right here. You need help. We're, we're on it. He loves intercessors. And this is why we're a kingdom of priests, right? This is what Ty talked about. We're a kingdom of priests to be able to carry on our shoulders the, the needs, not just of the church, but the needs of those outside the church to be able to bring them that there may be one fold. So now God says, absolutely, Moses. He says, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And this is such an encouragement because it tells us that if we have the heart of an intercessor, if we love to pray for people, then God says, I know you by name. We're friends. And that's why people say that God's, well, the Bible, people, that God spoke to Moses as a friend, face to face. So Moses now, he's emboldened, right? He's like, whoa, this is great. He's, he's listening to me. And now he says this, please show me your glory. Now this was his prayer in Psalm 90, remember? Reveal your glory. This is the last or one of the last words in, in, the, in, the, in the chapter. And this is in his mother's name. Remember? Jacobed means Yah, Yahweh is glorious. So even his mother is like, the Lord is glorious. And now he says, I want to see, can I see your glory, please? And it was his humility. If this had been a pompous request, like, show me your glory, like, let's see the glory, he would have been consumed on the spot. But it was a humble request. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the, now we've heard the name of the Lord. Apparently there's more to God's name, right? God says, I'm Yahweh. Then he says, I'm the warrior God, right? The God. And now he's saying, I'm going to proclaim my name. So God is giving, not just going back to reinstitute. And he says, come up. He says, bring another tablet, like the two that were broken. Bring those back up. Come up to me. And Moses goes up, and he spends another 40 days. If you go, I think it's Deuteronomy 9 and 10, you'll see that there were actually three periods of 40, of fasting, that Moses goes up first. When the law is given, there's 40 days. Second, when he goes up um, to get the, uh, what's it called, the uh, instructions for building the sanctuary, which is when they're all, all the commotion is happening with the golden calf, that's another 40 days. And then when he goes up the third time to reinstitute them into the covenant and bring up new, um, new tablets for God to engrave, that's the third time. So actually, it was a continuous 140 days of fasting. And what this shows is that we live by the word of God. This is a miracle, right? This is, you know, this is actually, I'd never seen this, but this is something um, uh, Richard Davidson, who wrote the commentary a few years ago, he's like, did you know this? Like when I was writing my thesis, he's like, I just noticed this. It was actually three times. 
And to me, it boggles the mind that someone who's been studying Old Testament, who's brilliant for years and decades, he's emeritus professor now, he's still finding stuff out, right? This is, scripture is inexhaustible. Its gems are always there for us to explore. So now we see that the glory of God or the goodness of God is his glory, or the glory of God is his goodness. It's not this consuming fire that's scary, and there was lightning, and there was thunder, and the Israelites were like, oh, we're afraid, you go up, Moses, because the glory is too much for us. It's like, no, the glory is amazing. They needed to see the glory, and actually, the reason they didn't go up, they were all invited to go up. Actually, we're not going to get into that, we don't have time, but ask me about it later. Uh, so, the Lord, he goes up, and he hides Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he pronounces his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. So now he says... And, and I, there's some ellipses there, so there's text that I didn't because it's too much text. But in this, we see a reversal of what commandment? It's the second commandment, the commandment that says don't make idols, the one that they'd broken. God comes in and he proclaims his name, and he repeats the second commandment in reverse and expands it. He expands it. He says, in the second commandment, I said I'm a jealous God. Now I'm telling you my name. Like, it's, it's more than just one of my attributes. It's who I am. I love you so much that it breaks my heart every time that you turn your neck to look at something else, to look at something else that calls your attention, to expect something else to save you because you're gonna, you're gonna, it's going to hurt you. It's, it's going to hurt. Actually, it hurts. I think it hurts a God more than it hurts us, to be honest. But here we see that the glory of God is to give and to forgive, right? This is what we see on Calvary. Christ was hanging on the cross, but what did he do? He forgave the thief. This was his crowning moment. He was crowned as the savior of the world, and his glory was seen by his forgiveness. Even today, I tell you, I can tell you even today, when it looks that I'm at the lowest place in my life, I am truly crowned the king of the world. I have been victorious, and you will be with me in paradise that day. So we've seen now that God's name, he's the covenant God of the fathers. He's the I am, the God who was, is, and is to come. He's a man of war who saves, fights our battles. He's a shield of protection. He's our salvation. He's a loving husband and a vulnerable and jealous husband. Uh, the Song of Solomon climaxes in this prayer that says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, the very flame of Yah. It's short for Yahweh. This is who God is, right? This is the love of God who wants so desperately for us to engrave him as a seal upon our heart, as a seal upon our arm, what we love, what we do. It's the service of God, not just lip service, but love and heart service. Because his love is as strong as death. He's going to do whatever needs to be done. This is the burning, jealous love of Yahweh, who would descend even to death to redeem his adulterous wife. So now we come to the concept of freedom. This is my last slide. And we've talked about this, this text, uh, Galatians 5.1. For liberty, for freedom, therefore, for freedom God has set us free. Right? It's so that we can enjoy, that we can be free, that we can have abundant life. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, it says in John 10. But I have come that you might have life and have it to abundance. But we constantly are burdening ourselves with yokes that we are not meant to bear. And so Jesus says, he calls upon us. He says, those who are weak and heavy laden, he says, take my yoke. Not the yoke of bondage. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest, you will find freedom, you will find deliverance, you will find joy unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are such an awesome God. There is no end to the wonder that there is to be enjoyed in your presence. There are pleasures forevermore, and yet we are so 
deceived and our resolutions are as ropes of sand and we continue to fail and we continue to fall. But as we saw today, your mercy runs deeper than our sin and you are always ready and willing to yoke up with us again, to guide us gently through the righteous way and to give us hope for tomorrow, to know that we can live forever with you and with one another in total freedom. And we ask you that we may all be there this day, every single person within the sound of my voice who's hearing today, may they commit their lives to you and may we all enjoy deliverance together forever in your presence, amen.